Good afternoon, church. Today we come to the final chapter of John's first letter, and our focus is on holy living in eternal life, which is also the theme of this week's Rema devotion. Now, I would like to begin by asking a few questions to help us think about what it means to live a holy life in light of eternity. What comes to mind when you hear the word holy? Is it something you strive for in your daily life? Or do you see it as reserved for those more spiritually mature, like Reverend Edmund or Bishop? (laughs) And when you think of eternal life, do you view it as something distant, Is something meant for after we leave this world? Or do you recognize it as a reality that affects our lives today? Now, these are important questions because they shape how we approach our Christian walk. And John's letter provides valuable insights into these ideas. How we answer these questions can reveal much about our understanding of our faith. In this passage, the Apostle John showed us that eternal life isn't just a future promise. It is a present reality that should influence every aspect of our lives. He also teaches that holy living isn't just possible. In fact, it's essential for those who truly embrace the eternal life God has given us. So building on this, John emphasizes throughout his letter that knowing God means walking in his light, living in his love, and abiding in his life. This foundational relationship with God is essential for us for Christians, for living a love, a holy life. And it brings us to our first point this afternoon, the foundation of holy living. In John, in 1 John 5, verse 1 to 5, John explains that our identity as those born of God is key to living a holy life with faith in Jesus Christ being central to both our identity and the practice of holiness. Let's look at 1 John 5, 1 to 5 again. Born of God. In this passage, John tells us that those who believe Jesus is the Christ are born of God. How many of you believe Jesus is the Christ? Show of hand. Not sure. Not sure. Now, this idea of being born of God is central to who we are as Christians. Earlier in, this, in his letter, John gives us a glimpse of what this means, being born of God. He shows us, he says in chapter 3, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. And in verse, in chapter 4, verse 7, he writes, Can you all read? Dear friends, together, love us. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. John, in his earlier, in his letter earlier, he wrote about the characteristic of one who is born of God. So now, who, is, who are those that are born of God? Born of God are those who believe Jesus Christ. Believe Jesus is the Christ. These are those people, are the people who are born of God. And so being born of God means we have reached a new nature, a nature that reflects God's holiness. And this new birth leads to a life marked by victory 
over sin and love for others. It's a transformation that begins when we put our faith in Jesus and continues as His Spirit works in us. Now think for a moment. Have you ever gone through a major change in your life? Have you ever gone through a major change in your life? Maybe a job change, or moving to a new place, or maybe your health. How did that change affect how you lived or interacted with others? How that change, that major change in your life, have affected how you live and interacted with others? In the same way, brothers and sisters, being born of God, should change how we live and how we relate to people around us. We all, we all know that living as Christians in the real world isn't easy. Living as Christians in the real world isn't easy. We face challenges. It's often easier to just go with the flow to do our own thing and to follow what the world is doing rather than to obey God. But remember, as Christians, we are born of God. That means we have His divine nature inside us. And this new nature doesn't want to disobey God. Peter reminds us in his second letter his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through this, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. Being born of God means we have His divine nature inside of us. And this new nature doesn't want to disobey God. In verse 4 of today's passage, John says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. You see, when the old nature is in control, we tend to disobey. But when we let the new nature lead, we live in obedience to God. The world still will still try to pull us back by appealing to our old desires. We read this in chapter 2. It makes God's commands seem heavy or burdensome. But when we live by the new nature, we find joy in obeying God's will. His commands become life-giving. Now, this idea is beautifully illustrated in Psalms 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible with 176 verses. A central theme in this psalm is that God's Word is a treasure. God's Word is a treasure. It's all self-sufficient and deeply loved by the psalmist. He uses... Eight different terms to describe God's words. Law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, word and ordinance, or some translation, rules and decrees. In nearly every verse, the psalmist mentions God's word. Not as a burden, but as something he loves and delights. In. He declares in verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. And then in 14, he rejoices in God's law and finds delight in him, in the law, in his words. To the psalmist, it is sweeter than honey. 
And he even turns God's decrees into a song. Verse 54, your decrees are the theme of my song, wherever I lodge. God's word is sweeter than honey. Imagine that. He turns God's decrees into song. Turning law into songs. It is like attending a concert where the orchestra plays the music based on traffic law. We might think, who would find that joyful? But yes, this is how the Psalmists view God's commands. Why? Because he loved the Lord. And out of that love, he cherished God's commandments. As verse 3 reminds us, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. In New Living Translation, it is even more direct. Loving God means keeping his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Amen? Now, for the psalmist, God's commandments were not burdensome. In the same way, for us as Christians today, keeping God's commands become, should become a joyful response to our love for Him. Just like how a child lovingly obeys a parent, we too, out of love, joyfully obey God. Now, let me ask those of you who are married uh -huh, or in a committed relationship. Who are those in a committed relationship? Don't dare. <laughs> now, think back to when you were courting or dating. Do you remember the excitement and joy you felt in doing things for your loved one? Yes? Hmm? Yeah. See, some of you nod your head. I remember my experience. Now, even if it means sacrificing time or, or energy, right? Yeah. What may have seemed like hard work, all right, during those times, and what may seem like hard work to others, didn't feel burdensome to you because love make it light, because love lighten burden. Take the story of Jacob. You all remember Jacob in the Old Testament who worked seven long years to marry Rachel? But Scripture tells us that they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Genesis 29, 20, right? He worked for seven long years, but it, seems a few, it just seemed only a few days to him because of his love for her. Why did time fly for Jacob? Why did time fly for Jacob? Because love turned burdens into joy. When you truly love someone, even the most challenging tasks feel lighter. And this is the transform, transforming power of love. In the same way, when we truly love God, Keeping his commands doesn't feel heavy. Instead, becomes, it should become a joy because of our love for him. Our love for him compels us to obey him gladly. And it's through this love and faith that we find the strength to overcome the world. Now, the word overcome is a favorite term of Apostle John. He uses it in chapter 2 to describe overcoming the evil one. And he repeats it seven times in the book of Revelation to describe believers and the blessings that come with overcoming. But John isn't talking about a special group of super Christians. No. John refers to all of us, every Christian, every Christian, because we are born of God. Because we are born of God. Overcoming is part of our new identity. 
because we are born of God. We are given this divine nature so that we can live a godly life. Live different from the world, although we are in the world. To be born of God means to share in His victory, a victory that comes through faith. But let me cl clarify. What kind of faith are we talking about? It is not faith about ourselves. It's faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As in verse 5 says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This victory is not about, isn't about material or worldly success. It's not about gaining power, wealth, or prestige. It is a spiritual victory, overcoming sin and death through faith in Christ. And this victory is not something we achieve by our own strength or effort. It is by the power of God at work in us. So how can we be sure that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God? How can we be sure? How can trust that the faith we have would help us to overcome the world is grounded in truth? John gives us the answer, witnesses, witnesses. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Brothers and sisters, God has given us a threefold testimony, the spirit, the water, and the blood. This confirms Jesus' divine identity and assures us of eternal life, giving us confidence in our faith. Now, what does John mean by water and blood. Most modern commentary believe that when John says Jesus came not by water only, but by water and blood, he is referring to two key events in Jesus' life, his baptism and his death on the cross. By highlighting both, John is emphasizing that Jesus remained fully divine not only during his baptism, but also in his suffering and death, affirming the, his, the reality of his incarnation. This refutes any claims during John's time that Jesus' divinity only for a short time. Another interpretation suggests that the water and the blood refer to the wound in Jesus' sight after his crucifixion, which confirmed the reality of his death. John 19, verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And so by stating in verses 7 through 8 that the Spirit also testifies to this wound, John makes it clear that believers must accept Jesus' death as a real physical event showing he was truly God in the flesh, the fully incarnate Savior. Whichever interpretation is adopted, John's defense of the incarnation is clear in these verses. Do you believe? Do you accept God's testimony? Now, the three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. In fact, in the Old Testament, God through His Spirit has inspired the prophets to prophesy about the coming of the Messiah. And until John the Baptist 
Let me read to you in John first, 29 through 34. The next day, John, John, uh, John the Baptist, not the Apostle John, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then, John the Baptist gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And, listen carefully, again he said, And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have sinned and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Amen? Wonderful. The Spirit of God. One of the witness. God's witness. Now, brothers and sisters, if we accept human testimony, God's testimony is even greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made Him out to be a liar. If you do not believe, do not believe God's Word, you are making God to be out to be a liar. But the scripture clearly tells us who is the liar. Satan. Satan is the liar. Whoever believes in the Son of God accept this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made God out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about His Son. Now, for those of you, those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, this testimony, the Spirit, the water and the blood, deepens our assurance of who it is. Amen? Only Fan Ming. <laughs> but if you are here today, if you are here today, and you are still seeking or have doubts, Consider this. Could God be inviting you to see Jesus in a new way? Now I'm talking to those who are still seeking or have doubts. Consider this. Could God be inviting you to see Jesus in a new way? As Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say I am? How will you respond to this divine testimony of God? What do you say? Who is Jesus? As we move forward in our understanding of John's message, we have come to a key promise, the promise of eternal life. This promise, my friends, is not just a side note of our spiritual journey, but rather the very heartbeat of our Christian faith. It is a promise that drives our pursuit of holiness and the living out of holy love. Now, the promise of eternal life is not just an idea far off in the future. It's a real hope that affects our daily lives and lights up our future. It means that our life in Christ doesn't end here, but goes on forever. It's a joy. It tells us that death isn't the end, but the start of a never-ending life with our Savior. So the first aspect we need to understand about this promise is its source. The promise of eternal life comes from God Himself. 
It's not a human invention or, or a philosophical idea, but a divine guarantee. Divine guarantee. John makes it clear that this promise is not a product of our wishful thinking, but a gift from our loving Father. He writes in verse 11, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. This statement is a powerful reminder that our eternal life is not something we earn or achieve. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. And we thank God He has revealed to us through His Son. And the second aspect of this promise is this certainty. The promise of eternal life is not a mere possibility, but a sure reality. It is not a hope that may or may not be fulfilled, but a guarantee that will surely come to pass. John affirmed this certainty when he writes, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. This statement is not a suggestion or a speculation. It can be, yes, a harsh word because it is a solid fact. It is a truth that stands firm regardless of our doubts, fears or circumstances. Whoever has life, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And the third aspect of this promise is, it, is its implications. Eternal life is not just a belief we hold, brothers and sisters, but a commitment we add on. It's not simply something we acknowledge, it's a truth that should, sh but it's a truth that should shape our lives today, our daily lives. This promise calls us to pursue holiness and to leave out hope, leave out love. It inspires us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Unfortunately, many Christians today believe in the lies of Satan that you can never overcome your sin. And when we he tried to dissuade us. The Bible, the commandments are all very burdensome. And then, when we fall short, he start to what? Accuse us. Because it is also the accuser. It is not just the liar, it is the accuser. So, brothers and sisters, let us come back to the truth of God, grow in the knowledge of the truth of God, and build up in our faith, knowing that, yes, I believe in Christ, I'm born of God, and God has given me the divine nature to escape the corruptions of the world, to live a life that glorifies Him. And finally, the promise of eternal life is a call to action. It urges us to fully embrace the life God has given us in Christ. It is a call to live with purpose, passion, and perseverance. It is a call to make the most of our time, talents, and treasures for the glory of God. And it is a call to live not for ourselves, but for the one who loves us and gave himself for us. And this is where the promise truly shines. Verse 13. Verse 13 reminds us, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Are you assured? This verse highlights the call of our assurance 
encouraging us to live in the light of this promise. It's a joy. It's a joy. Let us fix our eyes on what our Lord has done for us. Amen? As we conclude today, I want to leave you with this challenge. Holy living is not optional for those who have received eternal life in Christ. It is the natural outflow of that life. It is both a gift and a responsibility. As we embrace our identity as children of God, brothers and sisters, overcome the world through our faith. Rest in the assurance of the spirit, water and blood and live out our eternal life. Let us do so with joy, conviction and a deep desire to honour God in everything we do. For those considering baptism and confirmation, I encourage you to take this step of faith as a significant commitment to live out your relationship with Christ. Let your baptism be a public declaration of your decisions to follow Him and a commitment to continue growing in holiness. And, as, and for all of us, may we continually strive to live a life that reflects the eternal life we have received in Christ. A life of holiness, victory, and glory to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise of eternal life that if you have given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to live each day in the light of this truth of walking in holiness and love. Strengthen our faith, deepen our commitment, and fill us with the assurance that we are yours. For those still seeking or uncertain, may your Spirit lead them to see your truth and embrace the life you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.